Deep in the forest of Albion lay the small town of Oakvale, unchanged by time and untouched by the sword. Out of all the reviews I write, the toughest are when the games are just okay. They don't invigorate any extremely positive or negative emotions in me, they're just kind of there. Sometimes I've finished games I planned on doing for the channel and just don't make a video because of that feeling. I thought about doing that with Fable, but how could I? I mean, come on, it's Fable. This game is a cultural landmark. I remember back in middle school, there was another student who did a science fair project on morality in video games, and the Fable cover art was front and center on his trifold cardboard. Even if you've never played Fable before, I'm sure you've heard of Peter Molyneux, the founder of Lionhead Studios and lead designer behind the game. He was always excited to talk about his products before release, with features that may or may not have made it into the final game. Embellishment is a word I think of when I think of Peter Molyneux. A lot of details of the game's systems got greatly exaggerated, which leads to a lot of hype, which then leads to unattainable standards. I never fell victim to this hype, mainly because I didn't own an Xbox at the time of this game's release. So this look at Fable Anniversary, an HD remaster of the first game, is my first exposure to the game altogether. Let's hop to it. Outside of the new art style, the largest change that this remake holds is a new control scheme. This control scheme helps better match the control scheme of the sequels with your melee, ranged, and magic buttons each having their own dedicated face button. The control scheme makes it almost seamless swapping between the different styles, but the animations couldn't quite keep up. Swapping between melee and ranged weapons takes a real brief half second to unsheath your weapon, which, in the midst of combat, made it undesirable enough for me to just stick with the melee and magic. Unlike a lot of other RPGs, you don't really feel forced into any particular class archetype. Experience gets distributed independently into magic, ranged, and melee for you to spend on new abilities. This means that you couldn't devote all of your points into one tree even if you wanted to. The designers force you to play an all-powerful hero who excels at everything. It's an inspired decision, it's just a shame that I never really wanted to use ranged attacks. Having one button dedicated to magic is nice if you only plan on using one spell, but it makes it cumbersome to cycle through other spells. I admire the effort that Lionhead put into streamlining some obtuse RPG systems, but some of this feels a little too streamlined. You can opt to use the traditional control scheme, more similar to how the game played when it came out, but trust me, don't do that. How could I not talk about the Fable morality system? Your actions have consequences, and that's one of the major themes here. This system gets thrust on you right when the game starts. You start as a young boy in a small town on the day of your sister's birthday. With no money to call your own, you need to do some odd jobs to scrounge up some money. When walking past a cheating husband, maybe you'll take a bribe to keep quiet or report him to his wife. Decisions like this feed into your alignment. The more good deeds you do, the more heroic your alignment, and a halo may float atop your head, and townspeople flock to praise you. Evil deeds will sprout menacing horns and cause the masses to run in fear. I'm a sucker for when gameplay decisions you make have obvious visual feedback, so how can I not love this system? My only faults with it are that it didn't go quite far enough. Being able to see what sort of impact your decisions have on the world at large would have been awesome, beyond just the people's reaction to you. It seems like a really obvious thing to do, especially because time is skipped multiple times throughout your playthrough. I'm assuming that the developers agreed because I know systems like this were introduced in the game's sequels. After the opening sequence with you as a child and teenager, you are set free into the game's surprisingly claustrophobic world. You have the objective of finding your kidnapped mother and sister, but are free to take on some side quests along the way. Whether you're doing a main quest or a side quest, everything feeds into the idea of the guild. The quest table at the guild allows you to pick up a quest and mark it on your map for completion. It makes sense to have a lot of your side quests funneled through this system, but it sometimes felt the game was a little too much of a slave to the guild when it didn't need to be. After one particularly epic and revelatory quest, I was prompted to go back to the guild to pick up info about our next steps, 
rather than just discussing it with the NPC who was right there. What is cool about the quest system is how it gives you some in-universe difficulty settings through boasts. Before you pick up any quest, you have the option to boast about that quest, forcing some additional difficulty onto you with the benefit of having increased rewards should you succeed. You may boast that you can complete a quest naked and under a certain time, for example. Most of your questing will be through the game's linear world and doing lots of combat. The world is far from open. It's segmented into a bunch of small corridor-style rooms with a loading screen in between each. Take a look at my minimap when you're watching some of the on-screen gameplay and you can pretty easily see what I mean. The load screens, while short, are really frequent and especially painful in a fantasy RPG when I'm trying my hardest to immerse myself in the universe. It's a good thing that the combat is still fun. The unfortunate clunkiness brought about by the controls aren't enough to ruin it entirely. The lock-on system allows you to easily stay glued to your target while strafing and attacking, and the attack animations still look and feel good. The game was at its best during small skirmish-like encounters, but these systems crumbled under the weight of large-scale battles, which the game oddly throws at you all the time. Dynasty Warriors, this is not. And when the amount of enemies on screen was in the double digits, it was way too janky and laborious trying to handle them all without some magic. Nowhere is this more apparent than the terrible arena questline, which forces you to go through eight waves of increasingly numerous bad guys in a confined and dull space. When you're not fighting or going on quests, you can explore the game's towns and interact with many of the numerous non-combat systems. The game foregoes the traditional chat system or dialogue wheel in favor of an expression system. Flex your muscles to all the ladies, roar menacingly to scare people away. Although sometimes it felt a little too underbaked, I really liked it. It was a different way to interface with the world and its people, a system where you speak to the game through your actions, not your words. This holds true even during major story sequences with big decisions you have to make. A lot of the other non-combat systems feel really, really rough though. Real estate and marriage especially. There are so many things in here that I feel just got thrown in because they could advertise it on the back of the box. Yeah, the game has a real estate system, but man, it is not good. You have zero freedom in decorating your house, it's all done for you, and there really isn't any proper user interface to handle the system. You have to walk to the sign outside the house and keep hitting A to manage it. I'm down to get rid of UI if you can bake it into the game itself, but it feels like compromises were seriously made here. Maybe we should be glad real estate didn't have a UI because what menus are here are tough to navigate. Everything takes a real brief amount of time to load in, giving it a real clunky feeling. There are tons of menus and submenus, and don't even get me started on how bad the map is. I want to talk about some story spoilers from here on out, including the end of the game, so consider yourself warned. Your quest to get your kidnapped family members back eventually leads you to the Jack of Blades, the big bad of the game. He's boring and uninspired, both in terms of writing and visual design. During your first encounter with him, he will prompt you with the decision of whether or not to kill your childhood friend, Whisper. Despite the fact that I set her free, she shows up nowhere in the story thereafter, which gives me the sneaking suspicion that the script was written assuming you killed her just because the writers couldn't be bothered. Towards the end of the game, you encounter Jack again. In this climactic fight, you kill him and take his all-powerful sword. To unlock its true power, you can slay your sister or cast the sword down into the void, never to be used again. Naturally. I cut my sister down. I'm not one to turn down a giant flaming sword. <laughs> Despite Jack being defeated and the world presumably being saved, the game just kind of keeps going. You get set back to the guild, where there is little mention of the sister slain by your own hands and the giant magical evil sword on your back. You get thrust into a quest to step on some switches and save some mages or something. It's eventually revealed to you that Jack isn't really dead, and this final hour or so is dedicated to fighting his final form. It was a bizarrely paced and even more poorly written sequence, and is probably the worst part of the game. Also, not even 20 minutes after getting my new evil sword, I found an upgrade. Are you kidding me? I killed my sister for this, and it's not even the best weapon in the game? One character that I wish the writing had emphasized a little bit more was Maze. He's an ally who turns on you at the end of the game. He sides with Jack not because he wants to see Jack succeed, but because he believes Jack can't be beaten. It's a tragic and potentially emotional story, but I don't feel like Maze's character was in the story 
quite enough to give his sacrifice the impact it deserved. My playthrough of Fable didn't leave me with any triumphant highs or crushing lows. It was a fun game and is still decent to go back and play. I really appreciate how streamlined everything was. Taking complicated game mechanics and boiling them down into their more important bits is a really important design philosophy that I take really seriously, as it makes games more accessible. It's unfortunate that bad world design, occasionally clunky controls, and a poorly paced campaign prevent the game from being all that it could have been. These are dark times. The shadows of Albion are stirring, and strange winds are blowing. Your choices, whether they lead you down the path of good or evil, will change the face of the world. Now, take your guild seals and venture forth as heroes.